it's really cool because now your 80 percent of your deposit isn't doing nothing anymore it's now getting you something the the yield that it returns is is kind of dependent on what the market conditions are you know sometimes it's like super amazing and sometimes it's not as yield rates naturally fluctuate but the important thing is it's not earning you the nothing that was there from the start what's going on everybody today i'm talking with solvaki he is from beethoven x and it's a really innovative dex on phantom if you haven't heard of it already now they're looking to do some really cool things with reliquary and if you don't know what that is i'll be linking a past video i did with justin bevis from bite masons but before we dive in deeper, I got to hit you with that disclaimer. Everything in this video is just for education and entertainment purposes only. I am not a financial advisor. I am not getting paid nor sponsored to do this interview. So with that out of the way, I want to get your background quickly, Salvaki. Hello and welcome to the show. Hello. Uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me, Professor. Yeah, I do the financial reporting side at, at Beethoven X, as you said. I do. Uh, I'm quite involved in... Uh, trying to set up some governance structures and just being involved in with the community. My background coming before joining Beethoven was uh, was in finance and in, in both auditing and working within the retail and investment banking sector. And um, yeah, the challenge of finance is uh, traditional finance is what piqued my interest and just it's an exciting space to be in. For sure. So then what are you seeing with DeFi that is much different than the traditional markets? When treat you? What pulled you into the DeFi world and where do you see DeFi going? I think what was fascinating for me was that anyone could do anything. Like I know that some of the barriers have started coming down for the everyday person on the street to go and buy shares, for example. Five, ten years ago, it would be like you had to know someone, you had to go through a broker and you had to know how to do it. It was quite a few hoops to jump through and you wouldn't just have like your average Joe just going to buy shares where DeFi, that doesn't matter. Like DeFi, you need an internet connection, you need a wallet and you can do anything like the world is your oyster. Like that's good and bad because um, you have maybe people that aren't as uh, skilled or experienced as they are making financial decisions, perhaps on things they don't fully understand. But that comes with learning. The fact that you are not restricted based on who you are and anyone has an equal opportunity to at least be involved or participate is huge and like for me it is um, it's a really really cool concept so then where do you think DeFi is moving towards in the next year few years i think a few years is hard i think the DeFi that we know now should hopefully be unrecognizable in a few years like DeFi should constantly evolve that is one of the huge huge benefits of DeFi itself is the rate at which it can move the rate at which it can evolve the way to, the rate at which products can hit the market it's like in that sense trade uh, traditional finance cannot compare it like traditional finance by its nature is just um slower and so where it's going to go i'm not sure like because of like the various applications it's not DeFi isn't just one financial product it's i mean it's we're talking about the entire industry and how the industry is then moving together i mean maybe if you look at it, the nft market as an example like it started with like pretty much jpegs or like etherox right and that is great and that is like um custom art and it has its benefits but that is evolving to now you're seeing more more and more financial nfts hit the market and now the financial nfts you see now they are going to grow in their power and capability and that is just one sector that nfts can service and that is still part of DeFi. Um, what about other forms of NFTs that, that could possibly develop? Yeah, I think in terms of the, the longer term, I don't know, um, but I'm very excited to be part of where it is going and like working at Beethoven, being on the forefront of where it's going and being a part of that future. Um, so that's super exciting. And in the shorter term, I think DeFi is going to go 
perhaps through a period over the next year of maybe a bit of uh, quote unquote slowing down from its rapid pace because of everything that is happening with the uh, FTX, other centralized entities that have struggled or gone under over the last few months. And yes, they it's, it's a great advertisement for how strong DeFi is and um, what it is possible for. But when big players like that go underwater, um, there are impacts across the market. And those impacts will we'll see that, you know, th there's a lot of fear and uncertainty right, right now. And I think that that will drive what the next wave does and perhaps take away from, from that innovation that we've been seeing where maybe it's just, okay, let's just recheck and make sure that you know, what we're doing isn't susceptible to things like that. Well said. Well, shifting gears, you did mention that you do the financial reports for Beethoven X and a few other things. What kind of benefit does that provide for the users? How is that different from other decentralized exchanges that aren't doing it? I think taking that information and trying to, similar to your podcast, trying to be informative in a in a fun manner. I think you know there's a very common saying across um, across the industry of do your own research. But how many people do you actually know are able to do your own research? How many people do you actually know are able to go onto FTM scan, EtherScan, whatever scan, and extract that data, or to go and read a Dune dashboard and understand what that data is saying? We 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 are in this phase now where there's so much information available in DeFi because it's all there. It's on the network. Right. But what is important? What isn't important? What does it mean? Like that, I think, is an industry we haven't figured out yet. And uh, what we try to do at Beethoven is bridge that gap in terms of, well, giving our users insight, being like, well, you can verify everything that's in those reports by checking it if you're able to, but if you're not able to, like these are the numbers, these are what they mean. And it's not just a graph. There's a bit of context behind it in terms of, you know, what's happened in the market this month. Like then we try to look at like how competitors are doing it because it's just like in general, like it's not just, oh, look, look here, our, um, our TVL did this, our fees did this, our volumes did this. It needs to be put into context with what your competitors are doing. And you know, it's great, like you have applications like DeFi Llama, which I mean, I use DeFi Llama to collect some of the data I use, but it doesn't mean that everyone understands it. And it's pretty much comes down to, to what I said earlier in making that information easily digestible to anyone that is interested. I never thought about it that way, how by providing some of the more metrics, not only of what Beethoven is doing, but also the competitors, it's able to show a little bit more distinction. I think that's really cool. I never thought about that before. And when I read over the financial reports or I guess the statement from Beethoven X, I thought that I was looking at a stock company. It was really cool as opposed to a stock company where I have no idea what's going on. I can actually read some of the stuff that you put out there. I'm like, oh, that's actually kind of cool. Hey, that makes sense. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. That is probably the, the like of the biggest compliment that we can get. I think we, we are constantly looking to, to evolve and improve on the contents of that report, but that is our end, our end goal. And um, it's really cool to, to hear you say that. Thank you. My pleasure. At the same time, though, I'm going to ask a few questions on how to improve that report. Because I would like to see, number one, Beethoven's runway. And then number two, is it possible to, let's say, see how much the team is getting funded? in terms of payroll. Would that be possible to include in that report as well? Potentially, yeah. I think, and I think that's where we are gradually heading towards. I think the, the reason why it's not there currently is up until the we fully incorporate as a DAO, there, there was, in that aspect, there was a clear distinction of what um, the, the then the label was the team uh, would get an allocation of fees uh, pretty much the, uh, to a traditional equivalent of a revenue share. And that would then be separate to the protocol in terms of once the distribution happens, it's kind of then in a separate silo. And the financial reports is focused on the protocol itself 
and the treasury that the protocol owns. And that's why it wasn't previously included there. But now if you'll see, um, we've we started over the last few months, there's, there is a portion of the treasury that, that covers some of the salary costs. And that is included now, included there in a small part. And you'll see it in the treasury balance re reconciliation where there's a 20, 25K disbursement to the team every month. Is that um, 25K dollars or tokens? USDC. And um, that then complements what the team is doing out of its previous earnings uh, to, to feed Toronto. Now, if we then look at like the team like as a separate entity, um, there is runaway in there for about uh, another five months at current salaries. And then the treasury itself has a much longer runway. Beethoven treasury um, is close to $3 million, uh, um, which, you know, that is uh, up to like the community owns the treasury. So it's up to them to decide um, how the how their 3 million gets allocated. But I mean, that's just a bit of context why that team runaway isn't there it's because it's actually not strictly part of the protocol as we transition into a full DAO state all of that will get absorbed into one place and we'll have more of that uh, consolidated together but it's not something that just happens overnight why did you yeah. guys become a DAO? well i think it's kind of well, multiple reasons one like you want you have people that invest in in your token in your protocol they have lots of skills or experience on various different things and they have an opinion you know some ideas are good some ideas are good but not suited to the current requirements and you get to foster that more through it all like if you do if you have a typical corporate structure none of that exists right if you have a typical co corporate structure you have a centralized group that is making all the decisions and it doesn't sit right to be on the forefront and pushing like the narrative for decentralized finance but then have a centralized team behind it now i know that you know when beethoven first launched it it was a bit like that but like the protocol was not even a month old before they started putting out governance votes for the community to decide right so really like that centralized portion would have only been at deployment people came together and said hey let's do a, a cool protocol and then after that it became a DAO because that it is closer aligned to the ethos of everything that we're doing in DeFi and everyone has a voice, everyone has that opportunity. Why when, you know, I spoke earlier about how DeFi gives opportunities to everyone. Why when you interact with Beethoven, should you be restricted to a group of people that would be the equivalent of a digital board of directors like we didn't we didn't want that so we always functioned as a DAO but you know to say you're a DAO and to actually be a DAO are two different things and like we are committed to functioning as a DAO and not just giving the appearance of a DAO isn't Pardon? there a lot of stigma behind DAOs if you ask a lot of people people say it's probably great in theory but in actuality it doesn't follow through as such so if Beethoven X is pretty much functioning like a DAO already. What is the benefit of actually fully going through on that then? Well, it creates that um, that legal wrapper, right? Right now, Beethoven, can, Beethoven X can only exist on the digital landscape. And I think DeFi, as it evolves, will evolve outside of just only having um, this influence in the digital landscape. It will come into more traditional structures and there needs to be a means to engage with that. And that is why we spent a lot of time trying to establish what is the right way to do that. And, um, you know, you raise an interesting question that um, people do, there is stigma on the DAO. The question is, why do you think there's a stigma behind the DAO? Why do we think there's so much potential red tape around the DAO? And, you know, my personal view is, oh, it's because there's a lack of education across the board. People want to be part of a DAO, but we don't know how to DAO. We don't know how to necessarily act in the best interests of the protocol. We don't know how to strategically think about things. And the only way we get there is by spending time discussing ideas and learning from each other. And that is the one thing that is um, I, I've really enjoyed 
in in the Beethoven community is the willingness of the community to discuss ideas, to to talk about things, and everyone has a voice. It doesn't matter like when you're discussing in the forums, like you don't have to have like a certain holder percentage to say your ideas, right? Anyone can say anything. Like if I engage with something on a potential idea that they have, I don't know how big the FB voting size is. And it because it doesn't matter. It's then just having the discussion and deciding, well, is it in the best interest of the protocol? Does it make sense from either strategic perspective, from a treasury perspective? And together we learn and we've come to terms with the fact that, you know, because there's no framework out there for these things, like it's not going to be perfect out the box, but that is how many DeFi protocols in general, like the technology is perfect out the box. Uniswap came out with V1, they launched V2, they did V3, they're going to do V4, right? Yeah, V4. Like, okay. So if, if we've come to terms with that, the technology we work with evolves, why do we, why is it not possible for the DAO and the people that interact with the DAO also to evolve with it? I know there's a bit more PVP potential in the DAO environment, um, because you know, you, you interacting with more head on with different people's personalities, but that's arguably, um, one of DeFi's greatest strengths is that you that everyone can come to the table if they choose to like it's not they are only left out because they choose not to participate understood um, so when it comes cool. to dexes from what i understand is is extremely competitive and not really profitable so because we talked already about uniswap and there's a million other dexes out there so how does it feel to try to be competing in that landscape? Exciting, like, because it is challenging, right? It is, and you, you're going, you're going to toe to toe with some of the brightest minds out there. Right? And that, that's, that's like the, the ultimate challenge. I mean, like we don't, um, you, you look around and you see, um, you see Uniswap, you see, well, um, balances are a bit like our big brother um but you see curve you see kyber you see bancor and you see like these these ogs um built like these amazing products that they were very smart people that designed these concepts and can we compete against them can we what what can we do and you know it's it's a low profit environment because it's an inefficient environment and i think it's one of the things that that will evolve over time because there's a lot of challenges when it comes to the dex landscape that doesn't exist for example on money markets yeah it's it's cool to be a part of it it's cool to see how it's changing i mean beethoven's been around since um the launched october last year and even since then like the technology in the dex space has changed quite a bit just in that time i mean now, Solidly is like a hot topic and forks of Solidly, they didn't exist. Like that concept didn't exist. Andre spoke about it a year ago, right? But mm -hmm. it was only launched like Jan, Jan, Feb. So like that technology is, and that concept of Solidly hasn't been, has been around for less than you. And that, that's how much has changed, right? Whereas in now, like that's like, I guess you can call it the flavor of the week. Like that is like everyone a year and a half ago was spinning up Uni V2 forks. Uni launched V3 and it kind of brought the slowdown to that. And now solidly came around and everyone's um, spinning up copies of that. That makes it interesting to watch and interesting to like, you have to pay attention to what other people are doing and trying to see if you can remove those inefficiency like in a in a deck space you're always servicing three parties or four parties actually right so you have your your traders who want the best pricing mm -hmm. you have your liquidity providers who want rewards or returns for the risk that they're taking right you have um for us we have our fbeats holders who support the protocol and then you have the protocol itself and its treasury right and you need to find it now in the general construct. If we look at DEXs now in the older model, not everyone wins 
in that scenario, right? So who's gonna like if you lower if you if you lowered swap fees, traders would win, LP providers would lose, right? If you lifted swap fees, you'd lose traders, you'd lose volumes. You, so it didn't work. And boosted pools brings for us like the evolution of that process. Well, like not everyone has to lose because now you can offer LP providers aren't limited to swap fees. Like LP providers have the possibility to earn yield elsewhere while still providing liquidity. So you could lower swap fees, bringing more traders, bringing more volumes, but LP providers are still getting returns for the risk that they're taking. And you can offer higher yields on like stable swap pools. So for the audience that's not aware, can you quickly describe what are boosted pools? Boosted pools is a is a concept that that was born out of the fact that in traditional liquidity pools 80 85 percent sometimes 90 percent of the liquidity that sits in that pool is idle on an average day so idle being it's not used for trading so it's just sitting there and it's doing nothing right mm -hmm. that is incredibly inefficient so what boosted pools do it allows um that's a very clever piece of technology that allows that idle liquidity to be uh deployed elsewhere via counterparty so there, there is the introduction of counterparty risk but they would then go and use it to generate yield so what you are essentially doing by depositing into um well in the current iteration that we have um deployed when you deposit into one of our boosted pools, you are providing liquidity to the DEX, but you're also giving um, liquidity to a well TVL to a yield aggregator that is going to get you yields out in the market. And the yield strategy that it that that aggregator takes, you do have full transparency on it, whether it's a single strategy vault or whether it's a multi-strategy vault, you can choose. So it's not like you're entering into like this abyss of you put it there and where does my money go? Like we done a lot of work that if you go onto our onto our website, you can see which pools are, are boosted, which are not, who's doing the boost and where they're getting the boosted yields. So whether it's on a protocol like Aave or whether they, they farming you um, on Son, which is a new, newly released Vault and Optimism. Um, and it's really cool because now your 80% of your deposit isn't doing nothing anymore. It's now getting you something. The The yield that it returns is is kind of dependent on what the market conditions are. You know, sometimes it's like super amazing and sometimes it's not as yield rates naturally fluctuate. But the important thing is it's not earning you the nothing that was there from the start. So this may be a dumb question, but where does yield normally come from? Does it come from lending protocols where they'll lend it out and people can then try to, let's say, short certain tokens or do something else with it? Um, does it come from perhaps other DEXs that may be needing that liquidity and are willing to pay a little bit higher rates? Where do these yields typically come from? It actually comes from a variety of protocols on the network and it's wherever, like as the technology scales, it could be anything. I think right now the money market protocols are the easiest to access because they already have a baseline yield. So you go deposit into a protocol like Aave, they give you there there is a there's a interest rate that you get just for supplying based on whatever the market rates are. And you would get that yield together with whatever tokens they supplementing it with. So, you know, if you if you think about you know, everyone, um, okay, not everyone, but a lot of people go, well, how do you compete against new DEXs that keep launching and just printing tokens to infinity, right? Um, well, through boosted pools, like you can still grab a piece of that yield from new protocols that launch and that are incentivizing the TVL. Like the aggregators can go tap into those markets and you don't need to worry about the moving around of funds. They'll do it for you. They'll do the auto compounding for you. You'll just need to come to pay them and deposit. And that's just the yield side. I mean, where there's still normal liquidity mining incentives that happen on the pool itself. So your yield sources, then all of a sudden are swap fees, 
yield fees and liquidity mining fees and it becomes like a an attractive outcome and it also starts connecting liquidity across the network because now if we had to you know have let's say 20 million tbl in a stable pool that a significant portion of that could go be placed onto uh, onto a money market protocol and be available there and help that protocol with whatever it it needs to do on, on on that side and it then starts connecting like the DeFi legos together which is very very cool and it's it's the start i think like in terms of the way balance is is taking their technology like boosted pools is just the next isn't the last step it's just the next step well you guys are on right now phantom naturally i haven't seen a lot of boosted pools for that i know that you're also on optimism and that seems to have a lot of boosted pools. Are there going to be a lot more boosted pools on Phantom? And are you guys looking at other chains as well? So yes, boosted pools are coming to Phantom. There's two main reasons why they're not there is after we launched the the boosted pools and optimism, um, Balancer actually released a really cool update to the technology that we wanted to bring to to phantom and that technology was allowing us to set protocol fees at a pool level so the fee that the protocol takes across the board can be now customized for at an ind individual pool level it's not a static fee across the board why is that important because we can then significantly reduce the fee that the protocol takes on community created pools to attract more people to create pools and use the exchange. And we can have then our fee, our standard fee on the pools that we are incentivizing with Beats tokens, which then makes sense. Like we'll take a bigger fee for the pools that we're incentivizing and for the fees that we don't incentivize, we take a much, much smaller percentage fee. Um, so that was like first thing that delayed the release. And the second one is um, we're waiting for the pipe masons to finish uh, some of the testing they want to do on the multi-strat contracts that um, will be used in the boosted pool infrastructure. They're not that far away. Hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll be able to roll them out.